Swahili language, or Kiswahili, as it's called in Swahili. And by the way, ki is a prefix that means language. Swahili is one of the most widely spoken languages in Africa, and if we only consider languages that are native to Africa, then it is the most widely spoken. It is widely spoken over a wide area of East Africa. The number of native speakers of Swahili is actually rather small, somewhere between 5 and 15 million, but it is widely spoken as a lingua franca that unites the linguistically diverse population. Estimates vary, but the total number of proficient speakers, if we include second language and third language speakers, could be as high as 150 million or even more. Swahili is an official language in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and Democratic Republic of Congo, and it's spoken in other countries like Rwanda and Burundi. The closely related Comorian language spoken in Comoros is also sometimes considered a dialect of Swahili. Chances are that you know a little bit of Swahili already, whether you know it or not. If you've seen the Disney movie Lion King, then you know the name Simba. Simba means lion in Swahili. And maybe you remember Nala. Nala means gift in Swahili. Then there's Rafiki. Rafiki means friend in Swahili. And of course there's Pumba. Pumba means stupid in Swahili. And of course there's Hakuna Matata. Hakuna Matata means no worries in Swahili. Simba, Nala, Rafiki, Pumba, Hakuna Matata. Swahili is one of the Bantu languages. That's a traditional branch of the Niger Congo language family. There are around 250 Bantu languages, depending on what we consider a language versus a dialect. The history of Swahili is somewhat unclear, but it originally developed as a language of coastal areas of Kenya and Tanzania. Fishermen spread the language to nearby islands, then over the following centuries, traders from these islands spread the language to a larger area of the coast. Today, this coastal region stretching from southern Somalia all the way down to northern Mozambique is where most of Swahili's native speakers are found. The areas where Swahili is spoken had a lot of interaction with foreign traders, particularly those from the Middle East throughout the Middle Ages. One of the main commodities the traders were seeking was cloves, so Persian and Arab traders established cloves farms in the Zanzibar archipelago, and they also established trading settlements along the mainland coast. With both foreign traders and local African Swahili-speaking traders settling along the new trade route, Swahili absorbed many foreign loanwords, especially from Arabic. In fact, the name of the language itself, Swahili, comes from Arabic. The Arabic word for coast is Sahil, and the plural form is Sawahil. So with the prefix ki, Kiswahili means the language of the coasts. In large part, this interaction between foreign Muslim traders and local Africans is what made the Swahili language what it is today. A Bantu language with a large number of loanwords from other languages, especially Arabic, but also Persian, Malay, and other languages too. Contact with European colonial powers also influenced Swahili. Portugal began establishing colonies in East Africa in 1505 CE, including in Zanzibar and along the Kenyan and Tanzanian coasts. And as you might predict, this led to the adoption of some Portuguese vocabulary. But by about 1730 CE, Omani Arabs had retaken that region from the Portuguese and re-established control over it. Around that time, in the early 18th century, Swahili spread further inland with Arab ivory and slave trade caravans. This brought Swahili to more inland areas of Kenya and Tanzania, to the eastern part of Congo, northern Uganda, and Rwanda and Burundi. In the mid-18th century, the British and the Germans began colonizing the area. Germany took Tanganyika, or modern-day Tanzania, as a colony in 1886, and the British took control of Kenya, then called the East Africa Protectorate, in 1895. And they both encouraged the use of Swahili as a national language to unite the population which spoke dozens of different languages. Germany made Swahili the official and administrative language in Tanganyika, while the British made English the official language at the highest levels in Kenya. English was the language for national administration and for higher education, but Swahili was made the language for local administration and for primary education. In order to help spread the Swahili language, it needed to be standardized. So in 1928, a conference was called for this purpose, and the dialect of Zanzibar was chosen as the basis for the standard language. Its status as an official language or national language, as well as the language of education, has made Swahili widely spoken as a second language or third language in Kenya and Tanzania, and in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. In Tanzania, around 80% of the people can speak it, and amongst the younger generations, it is becoming more widely spoken as a native language, especially in the urban areas. And the situation is similar in Kenya. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, it's most widely spoken in the eastern part of the country, but in total around 50% of the population are proficient in the language. It is also fairly widely spoken in Rwanda and 
Burundi, and to some extent in Uganda as well. But even though Swahili has been made an official language in Uganda and it is compulsory to learn in schools, a lot of people are not interested in learning it and a lot of schools haven't actually been teaching it. At least that's what I hear. So what is Swahili like? Orthography. Well, it used to be written in the Arabic script, but because of European colonial influence, it is now written in the Latin script. And it's written phonetically, so that each letter represents just one sound in the language. Phonology. Swahili has five vowel sounds which are always fully pronounced and not produced. There are no diphthongs. That means that there are no combination of vowels pronounced as a single syllable, like I or ow or o. If you see two vowels side by side, they have to be pronounced as separate syllables. This makes the phonology generally quite easy to learn. And all Swahili consonants have English equivalents. But there are some things to be careful of, too. Nasal consonants can come before other consonants with no vowel in between. For example, means child, Mbwa. means dog, Didi. means banana. Learning how to pronounce these sounds together may be a challenge at first if you've never spoken a language with that feature before. Grammar, articles. There are no particles in Swahili. There is no equivalent to a or the in the language. Nouns. Swahili has a system of noun classes. Noun classes are categories of different types of nouns that are represented by specific prefixes. In most cases, one singular and one plural for each type of noun. First, the mwa class. Nouns in this class represent people or animate beings. Words with the m prefix are singular, those with the wa prefix are plural. For example, baby. Mutata. Babies. Watata. Insect. Mutata. Insects. Another class is the m mi class. Nouns in this class represent trees or plants. Words with the m or mu prefix are singular, while those with the mi prefix are plural. Tree. Mti. Trees. Mti. Another class is the m mi class. This class includes a wide variety of nouns, including some animals, loanwords, and miscellaneous other words. This is the biggest of the noun classes because of all the loanwords in Swahili. And for this class, the m prefix denotes both singular and plural. Birds. Nay. But this class gets quite complicated, and sometimes the prefix changes. It changes to an m sound, like an m, before a b or a v. Wine. Vino. Wines. Vino. And other words in this class lose their prefix altogether. So it's interesting to note that in English, the plural form is indicated by the s suffix at the end of the word, but in Swahili, it's indicated by a prefix at the beginning of the word. Noun classes are known to be one of the biggest challenges facing learners of Swahili. Adjectives. Noun class prefixes are also applied to adjectives that modify those nouns. So the word for good, the base form is Zuri. But we add a prefix. Mito Zuri. Means a good person. Watu Wazuri. Means good people. So the prefix changes not only on the noun but also on the adjective. Adverbs. Adverbs can be formed from the base form of the adjective by adding the prefix V. Good. Zuri. Well. Zuri. Bad. 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 Be bad. Here's an example sentence. Arizona. Be bad. He read badly. Adverbs can also be formed from nouns by adding the word qua before them. Theory. Means secret. Qua theory. Means secretly. Verbs. Aside from noun classes, the other main thing about Swahili that requires some adjustment from learners is the verbal system. In Swahili, a basic verb consists of a subject prefix, a tense marker, an object infix, if the object is not a separate word, and the verb stem. Here are some examples. This means, he gave me the book. A is the subject pronoun, meaning he. Ni is the tense marker indicating past tense. Ni is the object marker for me. And pa is the verb stem, meaning give. And kitabu means book. And that's a long word from Arabic. We can change the tense of the sentence by changing the tense marker. This means he will give me the book in the future tense. So we change li, the past tense marker, to ta, the future tense marker. Now let's change the subject of the sentence. That means you will give me the book. So we change the subject prefix from a, which means he, to u, which means you. One interesting thing is that there are negative subject prefixes. That means we can make the sentence negative by using a different subject pronoun. Here's an example. That means he will not give me the book. So remember the positive form was that meant he will give me the book. But 
we change the up to hot, and that is the negative equivalent of the subject prefix. So every subject prefix has a negative equivalent, and you have to remember both, and you have to think about which one to use when you're speaking. The basic syntax of Swahili is SVO when there is no object infix. This means elephants eat grass. In this sentence, tempo means elephant. Wa equals they, that's the subject prefix. Na equals present tense marker. Kula equals eat. And yasi equals grass. So you can see that when we use a specific noun as the subject, we still use the subject prefix attached to the verb. Another example. This means I love eating. Ni is the subject marker, meaning I. Na is the present tense marker. Penda equals love. And kula equals eating. And of course that's S, V, O. Is Swahili easy to learn? Well, the pronunciation is known for being very straightforward, and the grammar is very logical, but it's also very different unless you've studied the Bantu language before. The noun class system and the verbal system with all of its affixes require some extra attention to learn. And for English speakers, the lack of immediately recognizable vocabulary might be a challenge. But if you happen to speak Arabic, then you will immediately recognize lots of Swahili vocabulary. Here are some examples. Comes from Arabic. Khatar, which means danger. Comes from Arabic Safar, which means travel. Comes from Arabic Mahal, which means place. Comes from the Arabic Kitab, which means book. Bamidi comes from the Arabic Bari, which means cold. And that's just a small sample. There are lots of Arabic words in Swahili, all speakers as well. Let us know in the comments down below. Now, for anyone who doesn't follow Lang Focus on Twitter or on Facebook or on Instagram, Now, uh, tumeweza kuona uh, namna Kiswahili kimeweza kuchipuka na hivi sasa twende kwa video ya pili ili tuweze kuzungumzia ni kitu gani ambacho kimetokana na video hii yetu.